good evening everybody uh, i am dr vansh bagla and today i am going to present on the topic of anisocoria and the moderator for today's class is dr shikha basi ma'am so first of all a pupil is basically an opening in the center of the iris that allows the light to enter it basically modulates the size of the aperture that lets the uh, lets the light in the pupil size is controlled by two parameters one being the sympathetic system and the other being the parasympathetic system so uh before discussing anisocoria we'll discuss the light reflex and the basic anatomy relating to it so when the light is shown uh, on the light the sensory input via the optic nerve to the optic uh, chiasma to the optic tract and then to the uh, pretectal nucleus which uh, relays into the edinger westphal nucleus important to note here is that it relays into both the edinger westphal nuclei and from here uh, the efferent pathway starts which goes through the red nucleus uh, via the optic tract into the ciliary ganglion where it uh, where it relays uh, and via the uh, short ciliary nerve into the coming on to the pupil pupillary dilation pathway uh, starts from the posterior lateral part of the hypothalamus and uh, goes to the uh, cilio uh, spinal center of budge which is at the uh, t8 c a uh, c8 to t1 and from here the uh, the efferent uh, pathway starts uh, which uh, goes to the superior cervical ganglion how and what is going and meanwhile you can go one slide back we'll finish the clinical implication then and there you said it supplies uh, Uh, both the uh, pretectal uh, nuclei, right? Yes. So, uh, any of the uh, first years, what's the clinical implication of this? What is it responsible for? Consensual. So, they are with you. Next. Moving on. Uh, so, the posterior lateral uh, hypothalamus. Uh, the pathway begins from the posterior lateral hypothalamus. begins from the posterior lateral hypothalamus and uh, then uh, this is the blue line the sympathetic pathway which uh, goes to the uh, cilio uh, cilio spinal center of budge which is the c8t1 and then uh, the efferent wing uh, starts which <coughs> uh, then relays into the superior cervical ganglion and uh, cilio uh, the superior cervical ganglion is uh, near the uh, <coughs> near the uh, carotid plexus and uh, uh, this uh, clinical uh, implication of this being that uh, the sympathetic uh, trunk near the uh, near the first and the second rib so uh, the significance being in case of pancos tumor uh, which will uh, be which will be present just near the first rib uh, th th there could be a horner syndrome presentation so from the superior cervical ganglion uh, the if the it will the from the superior cervical ganglion it will go to the uh, the cilio uh, cilio retinal artery and relay in the uh, and then relay in the so important to note here is that they, that in the entire pathway the first mm -hmm. order neuron uh, is from the central nervous system and the second and the third order neurons are from the peripheral uh, nervous system and synapse occurs in the superior cervical ganglion and there is no synapse in the ciliary ganglion coming on to the near reflex the near reflex did you mention that it goes through the cavernous sinus inside the brain no ma'am i did not mention that ah, so before reaching the ciliary ganglion the, it also crosses through the cavernous sinus all these things i didn't want to discuss the clinical implication but i want them to be very clear about the anatomy yes. this is really important to understand so uh, coming on to the near reflex there are three components uh, accommodation convergence and meiosis vision is not a prerequisite for the near reflex and uh, the stimuli in case of a near reflex is an unclear or a blurred image uh, important to note is the midbrain center for the near reflex is uh, located more ventrally than the pretectal nucleus the near reflex uh, travels via the optic nerve to the primary visual cortex in the visual association uh, cortex to the superior colliculus and pretectal nucleus and uh, via the third nerve nucleus uh, there is bilateral convergence via the edinger westphal nuclei uh, 
uh, via the sphincter pupillae meiosis occurs and via the ciliary muscles there occurs accommodation so coming on to uh, anisocoria anisocoria is basically the asymmetry of pupil size uh, of more than 1 mm uh, the there is variation in the uh, size so uh, my reference here is from the american academy of ophthalmology uh, anisocoria is basically due to the uh, disturbance in the efferent pathway dynamics now coming on to the classification of anisocoria anisocoria can be physiological and can be pathological in the pathological category it can be due to me uh, meiosis of one pupil and can and can be uh, due to midriasis of the other pupil uh, <clears throat> due to meiosis of uh, the pupil uh, the causes are being horner syndrome topical myotics iridocyclitis and little old ads the for midriasis the causes are third nerve palsy acute ads uh, topical sympathomimetic drugs topical parasympatholytic drugs and sphincter damage physiological anisocoria also known as simple or essential anisocoria is normal in 20% of the population the size of the pupil may vary from day to day or even from hour to hour in 10% subjects uh, in a room uh, may have an iso and may have an anisocoria of uh, 0.4 mm or more important to note that uh, physiological anisocoria remains same in uh, light conditions and in dark room conditions and there is no dilatation lag here so uh, when a patient with anisocoria comes to uh, the hospital uh, <clears throat> we will uh, first of all uh, uh, take the relevant history and eye examination in history we will ask for the duration of the anisocoria we may ask the patient to give uh, old photographs to uh, see uh, the anisocoria rule out any history of trauma rule out any history of topical myotics uh, any exposure to toxins or drugs any history of any neurological disease or glaucoma so uh, this is a flow chart showing an approach to anisocoria if uh, both the pupils react normally to light uh, <clears throat> then uh, we go on uh, to uh, go on in terms of uh, horner syndrome and we go for uh, a cocaine test and anisocoria greater than 1 mm will uh, lead to uh, a diagnosis of horner syndrome anisocoria less than 1 mm will lead to a diagnosis of physiological anisocoria and uh, when an apraclonidine uh, test is done the if the anisocoria reverses uh, we again come to the diagnosis of a horner syndrome and if the anis anisocoria persists after an apraclonidine test uh, we again reach the diagnosis of a physiological anisocoria if both the pupils are not reacting normally to light we go in for a slit lamp examination and uh, we check for any uh, physical or mechanical damage to the iris uh, if there is uh, no visible iris damage uh, no uh, sectoral iris palsy we go in for a dilute dilute uh, pilocarpine test uh, and if the larger pupil constricts suggesting supersensitivity uh, we come to the diagnosis of an ad stonic pupil if no pupillary constriction is there uh, we go in for a pilocarpine 1% and again uh, if no pupillary constriction uh, we reach the diagnosis of a pharm pharmacological anisocoria if pupillary constriction occurs uh, we think in term you know, in the lines of a third nerve uh, palsy so again uh, showing uh, the various photographs to uh, uh, to sh to show that before uh, uh, thinking about uh, neuroophthalmological causes of anisocoria we have to rule out uh, an acute angle closure glaucoma uh, trauma in this case uh, which uh, we will confirm with a good agonoscopic finding of eye. and then iritis uh, may sometimes lead to anisocoria and surgical history uh, will be will become very important as in this case which shows a surgical uh, sectoral iridectomy now again anisocoria greater uh, anisocoria uh, greater in dim light so uh, pharmacological anisocoria uh, with uh, topical meiotics and uh, like pilocarpine and sympathetic uh, systemic meiotics uh, can cause uh, pharmacological anisocoria parasympathetomimetics and sympatholytic drugs uh, can also cause mechanical anisocoria uh, like uh, posterior synechia trauma or surgery or anterior segment tumors even posterior uh, pseudo exfoliation is known to cause uh, anisocoria because of atrophy of the iris dilator muscles inflammatory anisocoria 
inflammatory anisocoria uh, may be seen with anterior uveitis and denervation anisocoria uh, may be seen with ed stonic pupil uh, Ar- argyle robertson pupil and uh, aberrant regeneration of the third nerve uh, when you go back yes sir one more slide yes ma'am so here uh, th- this diagram uh, is it a, a prelude to your uh, the slide which you were showing yes, where ma'am. i stopped you yes ma'am are we able to go from here to there where, where from, can you just start from here and then go to that slide yes ma'am so you said there is a patient of an isochoria hmm. and you've ruled out physiological Yes, or ma'am. in fact you've not ruled out physiological you 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 are going to see whether anisocoria is increasing in dim light or it's increasing in yes, bright ma'am. light yes ma'am okay so then you go to that slide yes ma'am so you've taken the patient in dim light yes, and ma'am. now the anisocoria is increasing yes, you ma'am. said yes. and if it is increasing the causes are all these causes can you just slowly explain just don't read out can you can you explain so that you know it stays with them yes ma'am there is, so first is what group of drugs are these basically ma'am uh, first of all uh, with respect to drugs most important like where where you you give clinical scenario where somebody is used you know yes, uh, one i already patient is on glaucoma medication or something mm-hmm. so you know that patient you put it in a dim light one eye if the patient has been using some pilocarpine eye drop the anisocoria is going to increase the other eye is going to dilate this eye is not going to dilate likewise all these drugs you know uh, uh, so what about uh, where, where are other drugs used ma'am uh, other drugs uh, again ma'am they are not used but they are as causes uh, we do enlist them ma'am okay you'll be showing those uh, cases i uh, later on okay mechanical again patient uh, posterior sinica and all one pupil is bound down so obviously obviously that's not going to uh, dilate and the other is going to dilate uh, uveitis same thing in uveitis you can have another thing that the patient could be on some drops which drop homoid eye drop so in that case the pupil might be mid dilated because of that and uh, so you you're going to explain about the uh, arp argel robertson pupil later on yes so now uh, moving on to anisocoria greater in dim light <clears throat> go back go back so here you had not listed horners yes, the ma'am. most important one yes, ju- this is like it's in continuation yes ma'am okay so now he is coming to the most important one these are the you know this is like he is just starting the topic kind of go to horners now so the most important one there which increases in dim light which you all should remember horners yes so a uh, horner syndrome is basically the presence of a lesion at any point along the ocular sympathetic pathway a 46 year old female history of upper eyelid drooping a left sided ear your uh, eye and neck pain since the past 2 weeks numbness of the cheek and altered taste sensation comes to us and uh, this is the uh, f- the photos of the pupil image 1 shows a right sided ptosis and meiosis in bright light image 2 shows anisocoria increasing in dim light and uh, following uh, installation of uh, uh, hydroxyamphetamine both the pupils dilate uh, indicating that the third uh, the third order neuron is intact so uh, in this very case the reason for showing this case first is that uh, is the importance of uh, understanding and diagnosing a horner syndrome because in this very patient uh, a ct scan demonstrated a right apical lung mass again uh, pancos tumor and horner syndrome in this case was secondary to a second neuron involvement second order neuron involved diagnosis of horners pharmacological diagnosis if you've used aproclonidine eye drop you don't have a diagnosis normal pupil dilates horners doesn't dilate here he has shown so you, you could have said it's physiological or whatever you know but uh, he's shown that uh, though hydroxyamphetamine eye drop it's not 
for the diagnosis. It's basically to distinguish between the first order and second order and third order, between the uh, second and third order uh, neuron disease. So here, this is what he's trying to show. You can carry on that it turned out to be a pancos tumor. As he had said previously, pancos is the cause of which order neuron? Second order. He had very clearly pointed out while describing the anatomy. Yeah, carry on, please. So, uh, coming on to the symptoms of uh, Horner's syndrome, there will be ipsilateral uh, meiosis, facial anhydrosis, ipsilateral uh, upper eyelid ptosis. And uh, important in this case is upside down ptosis will be present because there will be a mild lower eyelid uh, elevation. Anisocoria, as we just saw, and in acute phase of Horner's, there can be conjunctival hyperemia, facial flushing, nasal congestion uh, can also be present. Uh, iris heterochromia can be a feature in case of congenital cases. So uh, important in this case uh, is understanding anhydrosis. Can I just interrupt you a bunch? This is Dr. Smitha. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so because of that upside down ptosis, what is that finding characteristically known as? Because of the appearance of a uh, superior mild ptosis and a uh, lower lid ptosis, what is that eye called? Uh, uh, apparent enophthalmosis. Yes. Apparent enophthalmosis. Okay, good. And uh, before we do any of these drug tests, is there a clinical way of suspecting honor? Ma'am, uh... you did mention that word somewhere earlier in your slide. Anybody in the audience? I mean, I can't hear you guys, but you can ask this to the audience. Hey, is there sir. a clinical way? Okay. What, what do you want dilation? To... The level of the lesion we want to find out. No no, 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 no. My question is, how do you suspect Horner syndrome? Even before putting drops with the torchlight, it's a Ma'am, uh, the the symptoms of uh, meiosis, anhydrosis, uh, ptosis, uh, and okay. dilation no, lag. No, you did. I, I'm I'm looking for the term dilation lag. Yes. Dilation. So what what is dilation lag? That's very specific to Horner syndrome. Yes, ma'am. So, ma'am, uh, this is the uh, difference. Uh, dilatation lag is basically the difference between a physiological anisocoria and a Horner syndrome. So, okay, uh, when okay. uh, will uh, shine a light on the eye of the patient? The in a normal patient, uh, there will be uh, constriction, and after the light is removed, there uh, will be followed by a, a dilatation. So, uh, in a normal patient, this uh, phenomena will not. Uh, will uh, not take as much time as in case of a Horner syndrome. So the dil dilatation lag is mostly uh, four to five seconds, ma'am. Yeah, so basically when you shine the light five seconds after switching off the light, the normal pupil would have dilated, the Horners would still be small, but 15 seconds later, the anisocoria goes back to its original level. That is why five seconds after switching off the light, the anisocoria appears more, which means the difference in the size of the pupils appears more. But 15 seconds later, the pupil catches up and anisocoria goes back to the pre dark light, uh, dark scenario. This is called dilation lag. Okay. Yeah, please carry on. So, anhydrosis in a first order neuron uh, or a pre ganglionic uh, second order neuron causes anhydrosis of the ipsilateral head, neck, and uh, face. Uh, the pale side of the face is the one with the uh, sympathetic uh, deficit because the vessels and the uh, perspiratory glands have been denervated. In case of a third order or a postganglionic neuron, and the anhydrosis is limited to the ipsilateral forehead. When the uh, again uh, highlighting the importance of iris heterochromia in case of uh, a congenital uh, lesion. So uh, again highlighting the Horner syndrome uh, etiology uh, in case of a first order neuron. Uh, the with there are uh, there are syndromes uh, lateral medullary syndrome. A pontine lesion will lead to ipsilateral uh, cranial nerve 6 palsy, a trochlear uh, or a trochlear nucleus or a fascicle uh, in the brainstem will lead to contralateral uh, fourth cranial nerve palsy, a spinal cord lesion uh, will lead to quadri or uh, paraparesis, sensory deficit, bladder or bowel difficulty and hyperreflexia. So the first three, no, most common cause is a stroke. Yes, ma'am. So stroke could be the most common cause of first order. First order neuron disease. 
in the uh, second order neuron lesions uh, again the apical uh, lung tumor uh, neck lesions brachial plexus injury uh, lesion of the internal jugular vein uh, that is secondary to the central venous catheterization or a roland pi syndrome paralysis of the phrenic vagus and the recurrent lar laryngeal nerves honer syndrome uh, in yeah, case you are of... continuing the second order yes ma'am yeah in the uh, second order neuron uh, would be the carotid artery dissection cavernous sinus lesion uh, superior cervical ganglion lesion trigeminal autom autonomic syndrome and uh, intra uh, uh, intraocular trauma or tumor how cavernous sinus is in second order cavernous sinus is inside the brain right yes ma'am so that's the third order you got you've made the stable or you've taken it i've made the stable ma'am you made the stable i can make out okay carry on so again uh, going to pharmacological testing of horner syndrome uh, aprocloridine is used 0.5% or 1% uh, stimulation of alpha 1 receptors a horner's pupil will dilate in case uh, of an aprocloridine test due to upregulation of the alpha 1 receptors in case of a cocaine cocaine test 10% uh, in 10% cocaine is used uh, cocaine basically bro blocks the uh, norepinephrine reuptake uh, from the postganglionic fibers a normal pupil in in this case will dilate a horner's pupil will not dilate as uh, norepinephrine is not released because uh, because of the uh, the sim ocular sympathetic uh, pathway lesion a phenylephrine or adrenaline test uh, stimulation of the adrenergic receptors normal and pre pre ganglionic uh, uh, will not dilate and the post ganglionic will dilate due to denervation sensitivity uh, a hydroxy amphetamine uh, test increases release of norepinephrine from the post ganglionic nerve endings uh, normal pre ganglionic will dilate and the post ganglionic will not dilate due to uh, due to no release of norepinephrine just a moment are you all clear on this can i ask you which is the test of choice to diagnose horners if you want to know if the patient has horners or not then classically which of these is used cocaine so you should have written cocaine first you are going a b c d not even a b c d why why cocaine is second in aprocloridine first maybe it's not more easily available aprocloridine than cocaine is not available so uh, though we are not doing cocaine test but uh, 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 how do you do it how many times do you put it how long does it take for it to act once yes ma'am ma i'll show a photo of the cocaine test so you you're going to elaborate on all these carry on so a uh, cocaine test in case of horner syndrome the right sided image shows uh, uh the right uh, both the pupils are reacting briskly to light and after topical administration of cocaine there is marked dilation in the left pupil but the right only uh, dilates very sl uh, very slightly so the response indicates that uh, the patient has a right horner syndrome in this case uh, an aprocloridine go back you didn't show how many times you're going to put how long did it take ma'am uh... go back yeah there only that cocaine test yes ma'am so you i'm like you put it and then immediately shine the torch and see no ma'am uh, we put it for uh, uh, we put we put the drops every 5 minutes every 5 uh, minutes how many times three times four times mm. this you can't put it that often it causes very bad corneal toxicity okay not more than two times though we don't do it but it takes around 30 to 45 minutes for it to you know uh uh show up the normal so what is the uh, what is it that you have to look for in cocaine test which pupil will dilate so the normal pupil will dilate and uh, go to the next slide yeah how is this test done Ma'am, again, uh, aprocloridine five percent uh, is instilled. Is it five percent? Point five percent, ma'am. Point five percent. So aprocloridine point five percent is instilled. 
uh, this uh, we put uh, every five minutes for uh, uh, a span of around thirty minutes. Is it? You've read up somewhere? Yes, ma'am. Yes. You're very sure about it. And what do you get? Ma'am, there is a reversal of anisocuria uh, hmm. in this case. And it's because of. Ma'am, it's because of uh, it is because of uh, denervation sensitivity because uh, the <clears throat> the normal pupil in this case uh, will uh, will not dilate and the horners uh, will uh, dilate. So what should stay with you is apraclonidine, reversal of anisocoria, and denervation sensitivity. You'll never get confused. Okay. So test of choice is cocaine. There you always remember the normal pupil dilates. Then you go to apraclonidine where there is a reversal of anisocoria, denovation sensitivity. Okay. Next. So uh, in a hydroxyamphetamine test, uh, we are basically, uh, uh, both the other tests were uh, qualitative tests. They did not uh, tell us about the uh, site of the lesion. Uh, whereas hydroxyamphetamine test uh, is a quantitative test, it, it tells us as to where the lesion is. So uh, if a hydroxyamphetamine test is positive, it tells us that the first and the second order neurons are not involved. So it is between the second order and the third order neuron. So uh, important, uh, important, uh, important, uh, important to highlight here also is pseudo Horner syndrome. It is it comes under the spectrum of normal anisocoria. Uh, in this case, uh, there will be ptosis on the side of the smaller pupil and uh, on the side of the normal, pu normal pupil. And pseudo Horner's and true Horner syndrome are best differentiated through pharmacological testing. Now, coming to congenital Horner syndrome, uh, the reason why uh, this is basically a study done by uh, Nut R and McLoon E. And uh, the reason for showing this graph is that. Uh, in the uh, total number of an cases of anisocoria, uh, there was a large number of cases of physiological and then Horner syndrome. And then came ADs and then came pharmacological dilatation. But uh, when uh, we considered uh, Horner syndrome, congenital cases were very high. And Horner syndrome due to uh, birth trauma and surgical history was second. And also uh, important here is uh, the, there was almost equal number of neuroblastoma cases. So that is the reason we need to uh, highlight congenital Horner syndrome here. So uh, in case one, a 12 year old baby uh, showed with a uh, mild left ptosis, examined by an ENT consultant diagnosed with recurrent uh, lymph node uh, enlargement, followed by uh, following an episode of tonsillitis, no other significant medical history. On examination, mild left ptosis was noted, plus subtle anisocoria in room light uh, was noted. Right eye pupil was uh, 3 mm and left eye was uh, 2 mm. Anisocoria resolved in the dark with both pupils dilating to 6 mm here. Therefore, uh, it was felt that the child was unlikely to have honors, but rather a congenital ptosis with a degree of physiological anisocoria. Pseudo horners. They were suspecting pseudo horners. Uh, eye exam was within normal limits. Review was planned in six weeks' time. But uh, during this uh, in between, uh, the child was reviewed by an ENT consultant who again noted a neck mass. Uh, neck mass had enlarged, and an ultrasonography was done, followed by a CT scan neck and chest abdomen. So the imaging showed a left-sided neuroblastoma in the neck. Uh, and on presentation, uh, the patient had ptosis, but pupils were both dilating to 6 mm. So uh, on following up the patient, the large neck mass uh, <coughs> showed the evidence of... Patient had only ptosis and no uh, anisocoria. The, the, the anisocoria, anisocoria was there, was but there. it was there was dilatation. Dark light. It resolved in dark conditions. So the neck mass uh, was uh, again. Uh, uh, it was basically a metastatic uh, spread to the liver, and biopsy showed uh, differentiated neuroblastoma, 
the child responded well to chemotherapy and uh, yeah and regression was uh, found so one year follow up of this child uh, he had no ptosis but there was again left meiosis was there so uh, in case 2 a 7 month old girl uh, with left eye ptosis on occasions since she was 4, 4 months old uh, recently uh, they had noted uh, pupils were sometimes of different sizes on examination no ptosis was noted uh, left eye pupil was 1 mm smaller than the right eye uh, in light and dark conditions initial diagnosis made was physiological anisocoria review after one week's time by the pediatric ophthalmologist showed no ptosis or anisocoria however the mother had taken photos when the child uh, had signs which showed left eye ptosis and meiosis both diagnosis of horner syndrome was made in spite of the intermittent presence of symptoms so these are the uh, photographs of the child an urgent uh, mri head and neck was done and uh, surgery was deferred uh, biomarkers were done in the meantime a repeat imaging showed a neuroblastoma biopsy of the lesion was carried out within a week which confirmed ganglion neuroblastoma in this case so uh, <clears throat> after highlighting the importance of uh, of identifying congenital horner syndrome i would like to uh, uh, go through the go through the pattern of how to evaluate a patient with uh, horner syndrome in a child less than 1 year first of all we have to rule out the history for birth trauma as it is the most common cause for congenital horners Uh, after no evidence for trauma has been found uh, we work up to rule out neuroblastoma and uh, the work, uh, in the process imaging is done uh, mri of uh, head neck chest and abdomen are done uh, important uh, in this case will be uh, doing biomarkers like uh, vinyl mendelic acid and uh, homovenylic acid also pediatric horner syndrome uh, can present atypically and uh, it can uh, can be a presenting sign of occult malignancy further uh, investigation to uh, exclude uh, space occupying lesions should be done and pharmacological tests uh, can help investigate uh, possible horners apraclonidine being more sensitive but cocaine is safer in infants because apraclonidine uh, in infants can cause apnea so this is a gist of uh, the the process of uh, if investigating for a child with uh, anisocoria moving on to uh, the third nerve uh, third nerve related lesions first we'll discuss the oculomotor nerve anatomy so the third nerve nucleus uh, uh, <coughs> so the third nerve nucle uh, the third nerve arises from the midbrain and uh, passes through the cerebral peduncles going on uh, going on uh, going on near the uh, posterior cerebral artery and uh, in relation to the superior uh, cere cerebellar artery as well the it divides into a superior branch and an inferior branch divides into a superior branch and an inf inferior branch superior branch supplies the lps and the superior rectus whereas the inferior branch will supply the medial rectus inferior rectus the inferior oblique and the ciliary ganglion one minute go back once yes. so it's the it is going the relation uh, there of posterior cerebral artery and superior cerebellar you've shown it but you didn't say it is that it goes in between the two yes okay so it uh, goes between the two and that's not cerebellar peduncle it is cerebral peduncle, cerebral peduncle. so again uh, this is an image showing a partial third nerve palsy the <clears throat> the eye is uh, the eye is down and out and uh, that is why we come uh, to the diagnosis of a third nerve palsy so again uh, in this uh, in this uh, image we are trying to show a posterior uh, uh, communicating artery aneurysm which is one of the most important causes for uh, uh, for a third nerve uh, third nerve palsy pupil involving a pupil involving third nerve palsy uh, a large pupil with no direct or consensual light reflex no meiosis during near reflex uh, will be termed as an internal ophthalmoplegia 
and associated with ptosis uh, elevation adduction uh, depression defic deficits will be an external ophthalmoplegia an isolated pupillary dilation uh, is not classically uh, considered as a third nerve palsy careful evaluation for subtle ptosis and abnormal extraocular uh, movement is also to be done uh, the most well known life threatening cause for third nerve palsy is a posterior communicating artery aneurysm as uh, shown in the uh, in the image before patients uh, will usually experience pain so uh, that that will be an important uh, clinching feature for us patient with an anisocoria uh, with pain of the temples and the jaw and the forehead uh, we need to suspect uh, an aneurysm so the diagnosis uh, is uh, radiological one minute watch what are the other causes of painful anisocoria anybody uh other causes for uh, painful anisocoria will be uh, internal carotid artery dissection ma'am and honors can be associated with a kind of migraine cluster headaches yes ma'am you know that yes so even that can cause painful anisocoria so etiology of a pupil involving third nerve palsy nuclear lesions are mostly vascular uh, in origin demyelination and tumors and fascicular lesions always ischemic or infiltrative rarely uh, inflammatory cavernous sinus syndrome uh, in, is an important cause presents with a cranial nerve palsy 3 4 5 6 plus a horner syndrome uh, posterior communicating artery uh, aneurysm uh, can also uh, uh, aneurysm can uh, lead to such a presentation so uh, in uh, 20% uh, cases a uh, vasculopathic uh, third nerve palsies always uh, involves the pupil until proven otherwise a non traumatic uh, pupil involving third nerve palsy uh, until proven otherwise you will will be considered as an aneurysm because it can be a very life threatening uh, condition so moving on to tonic pupil uh, anisocoria in this uh, case will be noticed by the patient or others mostly painless the patient will present with reading difficulty uh, and difficulty to uh, focus uh, refocusing from far to uh, from near to far photophobia more common in females so uh, ed is tonic pupil uh, is uh, the characteristic of this condition will be light near dissociation as shown in the photograph so uh, etiology in this case will be an efferent uh, an efferent uh, efferent pathway dysfunction the ciliary ganglion or the short ciliary nerve injury light near dissociation is characteristic sectoral palsy of the iris sphincter accommodative paresis and denervation cholinergic sen super sensitivity may be present so uh, important in of the iris and uh, an idiopathic tonic pupil is known as an ed's tonic pupil mostly unilateral uh, can be bilateral also uh, holmes ed syndrome is uh, basically a tonic pupil with uh, diminished uh, deep tendon reflexes and orthostatic hypotension in the examination for uh, a tonic pupil uh, mostly on presentation the pupil will be large in size in chronic cases may become myotic no also known as a little old ad's pupil uh, light near dissociation as i told uh, there is the anisocoria is worse in light in this case and depressed corneal sensations and bilaterality can be found in 10% cases one second uh, one please go back to your previous slide yes ma what is light near dissociation ma'am uh, light near dissociation ma'am we basically uh, ask the patient to uh, look at the, the accommodation in this case no no in simple words not what you are asking the patient to do what do you mean when you say there is light near dissociation yeah ma'am uh, when light reflex for this patient is present but the accommodation is uh, the the pupillary response to accommodation is poor now is the other way around okay light reflex is lost but near response is intact near response consists of three things right meiosis accommodation and convergence 
So when you do a light reflex, you ask the patient to look at a distance target because you want to eliminate near response. And when you do a near response, you don't do with the light, you do with the target because you don't want to get in light reflex. Light near dissociation means light response is either abolished or very poor, but near responses are intact. Okay? Yes, ma'am. So that, uh, other than tonic pupil, is there any other condition you can mention where you have this phenomenon? Diabetics, it can be present, ma'am. Diabetics can have tonic. Okay, fine. Yeah. Then? Anybody in the audience? Uh, an agile Robertson pupil, ma'am. Yes. AR pupil, accommodation retained. That's how we used to remember. Okay, mm -hmm. near response is there, but light is not. Okay. And when you say it's bilateral in 10% of cases, yes, are they symmetrically bilateral? Ma'am, uh... It is, it is not symmetrically bilateral. Uh, it occurs mostly after uh, uh, after uh, uh, six to eight weeks, uh, there is involvement of the other pupil. Yeah. In so, yeah. No, even if it occurs simultaneously, I was not asking simultaneous. I was asking symmetrical. So hmm. even if both eyes have ADs, there will still be some amount of anisocoria. Okay? They won't yeah. be of equal size. Hmm. Yeah. Please go ahead. So, uh, in pharmacological testing, uh, denervation sensitivity is demonstrated by pupillary constriction following uh, the installation of dilute pilocarpine. So, uh, how do we dilute the pilo pilocarpine in this case? Uh, the pilocarpine strength uh, can be obtained by diluting the commercial preparation, that is 1%, by uh, using uh, artificial tears or sterile uh, saline or balanced salt solution. The concentration we need here is 0.125%. Uh, so this is again uh, the dilute pilocarpine uh, test showing uh, in case of a uh, AD's pupil. Management for this? One, one sec. Yes, ma'am. Uh, actually, uh, do we use that 1% pilocarpine in our OPD to check for AD's pupil? Ma'am, we... We use a uh, 0.125 percent. No, no, I'm asking that is prepared. You prepare the solution to 0.125 percent, mm -hmm. but the pilocarpine what we use is from a vial, not the drops, and that is 0.5 percent. We take 0.1 of it and then we uh, make it to 0.4 uh, with using normal saline or distilled water. Usually we use distilled water, and that comes to 0.125 percent. We don't use 1% eye drops to make 0.125% solution. We use the vial. So evaluation for this patient, uh, we have to evaluate the detail. One, one second, sorry, Vansh. Please go back to the previous picture. Yes. Do you instill the diluted pilocarpine in one pupil or both pupils? Ma'am, uh, in the dilated pupil, uh, we will uh, instill. So you'll include only one eye, is it? No, you should always put it in both eyes. Okay, you put it about 10 minutes apart over half an hour, so three times, and the AD's pupil should become smaller than the normal size pupil, than the other pupil. Other people will not react at all. Why up. does it happen only in one pupil? Uh, because of uh, denervation, uh, uh, super sensitivity. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the counterpart in Horner's was which drug? Apraclonidine. Okay, then ma'am. So again, uh, showing light near dissociation, uh, accommodation is present, but the light reflex response is poor. Uh, other causes for light near dissociation uh, are afferent uh, conduction defect, AD's pupil, uh, herpes zoster ophthalmicus, uh, aberrant regeneration of the third nerve. Cause for bilateral light near dissociation can be neurosyphilis, type 1 diabetes, myotonic dystrophy, uh, perinod syndrome, familial amyloidosis, encephalitis, and chronic alcoholism also can show. So uh, moving on to a case uh, case report showing a bilateral AD stonic pupil. Uh, this was a 41-year-old male a presentation uh, presented with a progressively worsening glare, visual discomfort, uh, especially in sunlight and difficulty in doing near work for the past six months. Medical history was insignificant except that he had been diagnosed with impaired blood uh, glucose metabolism two years ago and was on lifestyle modification regime for the same. There was no relevant positive clinical or family history. Uh, rest of the examination was uh, unremarkable. Uh, a negative serology was found for HIV and syphilis. On examination, vision was uh, 6 by 6 and N5 in both eyes. Light near dissociation was noted. 
vermiform segmental contractions uh, were noted in the superior quadrant patient was prescribed a refractive error of, of plus 1 diopters fear for his accommodative paresis and lead and which led to elevation of some of his symptoms so the pupils uh, were dilate uh, were dilated at presentation at 7.5 mm and 7 mm pilocarpine 0.1% was instilled every 5 minutes for 45 minutes following which the pupil constriction was to uh, pupils came down to 3 mm so a diagnosis of idiopathic bilateral ed stonic pupil was made in this case so uh moving on do you like to describe what's happening yeah in the first clip uh, as we see when uh, the when we are asking the patient to uh, look up superior uh, when we are asking the patient to look to the right uh, both the uh, eyes are both the eyes are uh, that you you describe the left eye no yes, what the moment so when uh, it... I'll, i'll go to the first clip ma'am first yeah in this case when the patient is asked to look superiorly the left eye is moving medially so uh, signifying that there is an aberrant regeneration of the third nerve and uh, the superior rectus uh, the superior rectus fibers and the medial rectus fibers are in uh, close proximity with the third nerve so while there is a regeneration of the third nerve there is a uh, there is a uh, some amount of aberration that is there leading to the, uh, the uh, this aberration in movement describe the pupil ma'am the uh, left eye pupil is uh, the right eye pupil is reacting nicely to light whereas the left eye pupil is not reacting to light see in the left eye basically the only movement that is possible is slight adduction is possible rest of the movements are not there and you can see that uh, the uh, left eye pupil is uh, neither reacting to light nor dilating in dim light you see it's a small pupil it's a mid dilated pupil it's a little larger than the uh, right eye pupil but neither is it constricting nor is it dilating okay and uh, the patient's vision is good in that eye right so uh, what's happening here most wrong with this pupil and along with that you can see that the patient has kind of multiple cranial nerve palsies right there's some amount of ptosis and um, sixth is obviously not there and superior and inferior movements are not there so there is third as well so uh, yes good good so cavernous sinus you said because of what you said cavernous sinus lesion because of the multiple cranial but what if, how do you explain the pupil so can anyone explain the pupil what's happening with the pupil so it's it's a pupil involving third nerve but with the sixth nerve even sympathetic are involved so th this is called a pupil uh, cav cavernous sinus lesion pupil is you know it's 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 very rare that here both the uh, fibers that is the sympathetic as well as the parasympathetic are compromised okay so this pupil is not dilating also it's not there's no uh, dilatation there is no reaction it's just a mid dilated a little it's not a very widely dilated to it's it's a little larger than the right eye pupil but it's kind of fixed there what did the patient have ma'am uh, the patient had a uh, uh, the you, you you've gone through the case report go next you have some images or something Yeah. yeah. So the the patient had a aneurysm that was there, and uh, it's it's the cavernous segment of the internal carotid artery aneurysm causing compression of on all these uh, nerves. Yes. So uh, this is again moving on to a case report. Uh, a patient, uh, a patient, a uh, two-year-old child. came with uh, sacral pain and uh, diagnosis of ewing sarcoma was made 
on MRI, a six centimeter sacral mass uh, was consistent with a chordoma. Biopsy uh, showed high grade round blue cell tumor, and uh, KI 67 and CD 99 were also positive. Uh, a cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, vincristin, uh, ifosamide, if 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 and etopside uh, chemotherapy was started. So, uh, after two cycles of chemotherapy, patient uh, re started receiving uh, su uh, supportive hydration and antiemetics. And uh, there was uh, an isochoria found with fully dilated unreactive right eye pupil without ptosis. Diplopia, uh, there, there, was no to uh, there was no ptosis, diplopia, pain or impaired extraocular movement or any other neurological changes. Patient had a significant nausea with emesis after her first treatment cycle and was on an extensive antiemetic regime including apripotent, dexamethasone, ondansetron, prochlorperazine, lorazepam, and a scopalamine patch. This is the uh, pupillary finding of the patient. So what caused the anisocoria in this case? You've gone through the whole class. He's got some cases for you. Yeah. So uh, the scope... So you've shared your slides with them? No, ma'am. Okay. So uh, the scopalamine uh, patch was the reason uh, for the anisocoria in this patient. So uh, this is the second case of a 45-year-old female who underwent vaginal hysterectomy under spinal or epidural anesthesia. Hypertension was well controlled on drugs. Uh, there was history of uh, obstructive sleep apnea and recurrent uh, URI. Post-operatively, she was kept uh, under observation in a high dependency unit in view of OSA. After a few hours, she developed blurry vision and had unequal pupils. Uh, a neurologic, ne neurology uh, consultation was sent. Uh, there was no sign of any uh, raised ICP or any cranial nerve pathology. Uh, vision was 6x in both eyes. IOP was within normal limits. And uh, fundus examination showed normal posterior segment bilaterally. So this is the photo of the patient showing a right eye dilated pupil. And the left eye uh, was normal. So uh, what yes. can be the... Say whatever. You want to go back, back back yeah but you haven't mentioned the thing here yeah yeah, ma yeah so you haven't they can't answer so in view of the yeah what 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 was she on they want to know of the osa uh the patient was kept on uh it uh, was given a, a nebulization of epratropium and uh, budesonide yeah uh, the, the beta patient was not on beta blockers epratropium he's saying no yeah. hmm. so but then it should be bilateral no why is it unilateral? Bunch, what's the explanation? Yes, ma'am. So uh, the patient, uh, because of a recent uh, upper respiratory tract infection, uh, was uh, given nebulization with epiptropium and budesonide. And later it was noticed that the nebulization mask was not fitting properly. And the vapors were leaking, directed more towards the right side, showing the dilation of the pupil on the right side. So after three hours of discontinu discontinuation of nebulization, the size of the pupil gradually uh, decreased and back to normal size and the uh, equal to the left eye within 24 hours. So uh, there are case reports of unintentional anisocoria uh, reported with epratropium as uh, shown in the case uh, uh, just now. There has been uh, anisocoria reported with unintentional eye contact of hemorrhoidal creams. So anisocoria with... Uh, uh, selective uh, SSRIs has also been reported and again scopalamine patch uh, as uh, as we discussed with the case. So uh, sudden onset anisocoria in an ICU setting uh, can be due to uncle herniation uh, due to a cerebral uh, the, uh, due to an intracerebral hemorrhage and sudden anisocoria with uh, associated with pain as we discussed uh, can be due to uh, an in uh, internal carotid artery dissection or with my